My name is Mark Polk and this is my RV garage. I got bit by the RV bug when I was 15 years old and still have it today. I started in this industry washing campers and since that time I've helped educate over a quarter million RVers on how to safely and properly use and maintain their RV. My favorite pastimes are RVs, muscle cars, and motorcycles. Welcome to my RV garage. Our goal with Mark's RV Garage and RV Education 101 has always been to help educate you, the RV consumer, on how to properly and safely use and maintain your RV. RVing is intended to be fun, not stressful, and understanding how to use your RV enhances your RV experiences. In addition to Mark's RV Garage helping you learn more about your RV, we're very proud to announce the series has won a 2011 Tele Award. The Tele Awards honor the very best local, regional, and cable television commercials and programs, and the finest video and film productions created for the internet. Now let's get started with a brand new episode of Mark's RV Garage. <laughs> This episode of Mark's RV Garage is sponsored in part by Camping World, KOA, Explorer RV Insurance, and ASA Electronics. Well, today we install our TV antenna on the brand new rubber roof. This is actually a WineGuard motorized TV antenna that's available at Camping World. The motorized TV antenna works off of a touchpad rather than the uh, handle that you would normally see located on the roof of the RV. So when you want to raise or stow or rotate the antenna, it's just the push of a button. Very cool. Let's get started on the installation right now. Okay, the first step of our installation of the TV antenna is to decide where to place it on the roof. And the only real requirements are that it doesn't interfere with any other components and that it's uh, at least 10 inches in from the side and two feet from the front or rear. Okay, the next step is to attach our uh, antenna head to the booms. I'm just going to put these pins and just snap these small clips on. And then next we want to attach our coax cable to the head. And basically, to get a watertight seal, you want to finger tighten and then only give this a quarter of a turn after it's finger tight. I just want to give it a quarter of a turn. Okay, now we're getting ready to mount the antenna on the roof and we're going to just use our butyl tape like we did on the roof vents. Alright, we're ready to take our mounting screws and head up to the roof. Okay, we've got our antenna positioned on the roof. We've got our sealant on the plate, the bottom. And now we're going to mount it. I've got it lined up with this one roof rafter, so each side there'll be at least one screw that goes into a rafter, and then the remaining screws will go into the roof decking, so we won't have any issues. You just screw it in like we mentioned before, you'll see the uh, butyl tape kind of ooze out. Okay, since our uh, wiring, our coax cable, and control cables weren't routed through the roof, we're going to have to uh, make our connections, get, that, get those cables sealed really good, and then we're going to route our wires on top of the roof and drop down to where we want the uh, touchpad control panel mounted on the inside of the RV. Okay, we've got our first piece of rubber in the groove, and now uh, we, brought, we put our uh, control cable and coax cable through here and what we want to do at this point is go ahead and put some sealant in between and then we want to take our last rubber piece put it in the groove put our top plate on and then uh, install the screws and the next step is just to go ahead and make our uh, connections with the control cable and our coax cable and then uh, we've got a gasket that we're going to put in the cover three screws to seal it to the base plate and then all that's left is to route our wires over and install our touch pad ok 
Okay, we ran our uh, TV antenna control cable and coax cable over the roof. Everything on the roof is connected. Uh, what we're going to do eventually when we mount our refrigerator, we're going to run those two cables down uh, inside the back of the refrigerator so you won't see them running down the wall. And then we'll bring them out in this area. And this is where we're going to mount our control panel and our power supply for the TV. And I have a 12 volt wire. When we wired the power center, we dedicated a 12 volt wire outside here for the television. So we're going to mount those and we're going to make a few connections, but we're not going to be able to finish the uh, TV antenna until we box in our refrigerator and we can run the wires down and, and actually hook it up. Throughout this restoration project, I have reached out to many RV-related companies for any assistance they could provide. Without these sponsors, there is no way we could have continued to produce the show. One company in particular stepped up, providing us with numerous products to support the restoration project. That company is ASA Electronics. ASA Electronics is an international manufacturer and supplier of high-quality mobile electronics to the RV, van, marine, bus, limo, and commercial vehicle industries. ASA Electronics has been serving the RV industry for more than 30 years with premium brands specifically designed for RV applications. ASA provided us with our rooftop air conditioner, microwave, a digital wireless observation system, and when it came to entertainment, a Jensen LED illuminated flat screen TV, Jensen 12 volt stereo, and four Jensen speakers. Today we're going to install the roof mounted air conditioner, complements of ASA Electronics. Let's get up on the roof and get started right now. See what we want to do is move it over in two, if we only get it this far the first time and then, okay now we got to get the gas. How do we know it's covered? I'll, I'll look, just move it back. Installing the air conditioner is not that difficult. You need to make sure you follow all electrical codes and thoroughly read the installation instructions prior to installing the AC unit. Now we have enough cooling power to turn the old Yellowstone into an igloo if we want to. We'll test the AC unit as soon as we complete the rest of our 120 volt wiring. For more information on this 13,500 BTU roof mounted air conditioner, take a minute to visit www.asaelectronics.com. Okay, these, these Max Air 2 covers actually are on hinges, so we can flip it up if we have to do any work on the vent. 
So what I want you to do is flip it towards me, get the, the vent cover centered on the vent, and then put it back down. So raise it up. Is it centered on that vent? Yeah. Okay. And lower it down. All right. Now, do you think we should use this black one? Yeah. Okay. Let me get the rest of the tools. All right. When you, when you were up on the roof and I said to center that and tell me which side we would want to hinge it on, right? Well, we wanted it to open this direction. So our hinge, our actual hinge is going to go on this side. So I need you to take these brackets, put them on there, and bolt it and put a nut on it. Hold it with the screwdriver, and these don't have to be super tight. Okay. All we have to do is put our other two brackets over there, and the clips go in, and if we want to work on this, we just take the clips out, and then we can get to our vent. With this on, we can actually open the vent and use it if it's raining out or anything because this doesn't allow water to get inside. That's the nice thing about it. Okay? All right. All right. All we have to do is put our screws in here and then we'll close this, put our clips in, and that's it. Well, there you have it. They're easy to install and now we can maximize cross ventilation in the trailer and use our high powered fans in any weather conditions, rain or shine. For more information on the Max Air 2 vent covers, go to www.campingworld.com. Don't leave home without them. Now, no 1960s trailer restoration would be complete without a great stereo system. ASA Electronics sent me this Jensen 12 volt DC power wall mounted stereo. It has all the latest technology along with the tried and true audio entertainment options. The stereo features an AM FM tuner, CD and DVD player, as well as a weather band alert. It's iPod ready with full audio controls and charging abilities and it has a front USB input if you save music onto thumb drives. <laughs> to complement the stereo, ASA also sent me four Jensen speakers. With the surface mount speakers, you get high quality, theater worthy sound right in your RV. They offer easy to install audio solutions while providing you with the superior sound you want while you're out on the road. The Jensen flush mount speakers are waterproof so they can be used for outdoor entertainment as well. I can't wait to hear the stereo when it's installed. Let's not waste any more time. All right, two of the speakers are going to be located at the, the back of the trailer, and I already ran the wiring through the studs in the wall and brought it out where our stereo is going to be located. So I've got the rear speaker wire up here, and then the uh, front speakers are going to be on those shelves that we just were putting together. I just need to run another piece of wire out to each one of those. So we're going to have two front speakers, two rear speakers. Very cool. Okay, here's all our connections for the stereo, and basically you've got your iPod connector, you've got your video in, video out cables. If you wanted to watch a DVD, you would just connect these to the television, which I'm going to route some wires through the studs, bring them out at the TV set, so that'll all be hooked up. But right now our concern is to get our 12-volt positive and negative connected, and then this harness here has all of our speaker connections. We're just going to connect this harness, and now they're all labeled. It tells us which speaker to connect it to. I've got my speaker wire labeled, so it's going to be a piece of cake. We're just going to make these connections. I've got a, here's my power coming in from the battery, and I've got this on a dedicated uh, fuse, a 15-amp fuse, just for the stereo, so we won't get any static. 
won't have any problems with the sound quality of the stereo system. Okay, my thoughts with these uh, small shelves was that not only would it give me a good place to mount the speakers, but it would give me a little bit of storage for small items like keys and things, and it would make this overhead cabinet that we had in the shop tie into the rest of the RV and make it more like it, it was uh, designed for this trailer. <laughs> Well, the stereo wasn't that difficult to hook up, and I still have to run some audio and video cables from here to wherever the, the television's going to be located, but we really don't know where that's going to be just yet. Uh, that's so I can use the DVD player. But now, when we get to our final destination, we'll have some old classic rock and roll. Two of our three major systems in the restoration are almost completed, the water system and the electrical system. That leaves us with the LP gas system. Before we can install our LP gas appliances, cylinders, and regulator, we need to run our LP gas lines. To do that, we're going to run some copper tubing from the front of the trailer and branch it off to our four LP gas appliances. The range and oven, the furnace, the refrigerator, and the water heater. The trailer frame already has some holes through the cross members that we can route our copper tubing through and we'll use these rubber grommets to protect the gas lines from any damage. Wherever a fitting is required, we'll use a flaring tool to make our connections. Let's get busy running some LP gas lines in the old Yellowstone trailer. Whenever you flare tubing for an LP gas line, it's extremely important that you do it properly to create a good seal. When you cut the copper tubing, you want a nice straight cut. Then you want to ream the cut piece of tubing to remove any burrs or sharp edges. The flare needs to be smooth and free of any edges to seal properly. Next, we want to remember to put our fitting on before we flare the tubing. Until you become proficient at using a flaring tool, you should flare the tubing using a two-step process. Start by inserting the tubing in the flaring tool and clamp it down so it is flush with the top of the tool. Tighten the flaring cone down until it no longer turns. Now we reclamp the tubing in the tool with a little over an eighth of an inch sticking out past the edge of the tool and we flare it again. This will make a good flare that is the proper length without cracking the edge or creating burrs. Inspect the final flare for cracks, burrs, or any other defects that could prevent it from sealing. If there is a problem, cut the tubing off and start over again. I don't know if you remember when we originally demoed the trailer but there was an old LP gas light fixture in the trailer and we're gonna try and salvage that and use it in in the new trailer. Uh, what I have to do is route a quarter inch copper tubing from our main gas line up to where we want to uh, install the light. So I'm just going to drill some holes through the frame. We're going to route the tubing through and, and tie it into our LP gas system. <laughs> Thank you. 
What we're concerned with anytime we're dealing with copper is we don't want to, we want to prevent kinking the line and we want to make sure that when we start a fitting that it doesn't get cross threaded. Well, we've got our gas light mounted. It's very cool and on the uh, original label it says Humphrey and then in that, uh, I don't know if you remember when I was tearing the trailer apart, I found a folder that had some actual uh, owner's manuals and, and that type of thing in it. And inside were these Humphrey number 39 gas lamp mantles. And they're actually quite a bit bigger than the mantles that you would use on a Coleman type lantern these days. There were about four of these in there. And I'm hoping that after uh, 44 years, that they'll still be good and I don't know if you've ever used a mantle but all you really do is is put it over this groove tie the string this would be our globe we got to clean it up hopefully it still works all right our our quarter inch line is going to come down into the top of the T for our light and then uh, I mentioned earlier when you whenever you tighten these fittings up you always want to use a backup wrench and you don't have to use any pipe dope or Teflon tape. The flare is what will seal, and you don't have to over tighten it. It's compression fitting. We just want to make sure we get it good and snug so it seals. Right, this is the gas line that's actually going to go to our gas cylinders. I mentioned earlier that uh, our frame, our cross members had holes already in them, but they were missing a few grommets. So we picked the grommets up at the home improvement store. And you just have to push them in and they'll lock right in place. All right, so 42 inches. Okay, uh, basically underneath we've got our our tubing cut where the first T is going to branch off and go up to our oven and range top. And then this last piece of tubing, we're going to put three T's in. We're going to put one in for our refrigerator, one for our furnace, and at the end of that run, we're going to have the uh, one for our water heater. This will be our, uh, our main supply line, and then we'll branch off from here with a slightly smaller diameter uh, copper tubing that will run up to the appliances. Miss the next episode of Mark's RV Garage when Mark starts installing the LP gas appliances in the old Yellowstone trailer. At Explorer RV, we understand that a recreational vehicle is one of the biggest purchases you'll ever make. That's why we really take the time to discover what kind of insurance you require then we'll tailor a policy to that level of coverage. As your needs change over time, we'll check back to ensure your policy is still providing the value you're looking for. Choose the RV insurance experts. Choose Explorer RV. I have a little RV trivia for you. Back in the 30s, the average cost for a camping site at a trailer resort was $1 a week, and if you wanted electricity, it was an extra 25 cents. Today, depending on the location, you can expect to spend on average $30 to $40 a night at a private campground, and that may or may not include a full hookup. 
Performing routine maintenance on your generator assures years of reliable service. For the most part, maintenance schedules on generators are based on usage. Monitor the hour meter gauge on your generator and refer to the generator owner's manual for recommended service intervals. I like to know that the generator is going to start and run properly when I need it. I've produced over 15 DVDs to teach you how to use and maintain your RV, and I'm the author of three books that cover everything you need to know about your RV. Take a look at what we have to offer you, and happy camping. Drive your motorhome like a pro. Driving a motorhome, especially for the first time, can be very intimidating. This DVD is your complete video guide to professional driving techniques for beginners to experienced drivers. Let myself and professional driver Lauren Walsh provide you with the tools you can apply to help you become a professional driver. This DVD takes commercial driving training techniques and converts them into layman's terms. When most people were taught to drive, they were just taught the hows and not the whys. Teaching the whys or the mechanics of driving gives you all of the tools you need to drive like a pro. We're taking a few days off for some rest and relaxation and there's no better way to do it than in the RV at the Cape Hatteras KOA. It's located off Highway 12 on Hatteras Island, 25 miles south of Nags Head. Whether you like relaxing on the beach, swimming in the campground pool, or taking in all the local attractions, this Outer Banks campground has it all. Let's take a closer look. For endless, unspoiled sand, surf, and summer fun, head for the oceanfront Cape Hatteras KOA on the North Carolina Outer Banks. Your campsite is just a few steps over the dunes to the Atlantic. Walk the beach for miles, hunting for shells, casting for bluefish, and scouring the surface for dolphins, or head across this sliver of an island to Pamlico Sound, where windsurfers and kiteboarders head off toward the horizon. Enjoy a beautiful sunrise and later that evening a magnificent sunset. There's a full roster of summer activities at the campground. Everything from pool games to basketball tournaments, craft activities like bead jewelry making, live skits, and live music provided by the Summer Shiners. Finish with a dip in either of the two pools and grab a bite at the poolside snack bar. They've got a great staff here at the Cape Hatteras KOA. When we arrived with our Jeep in tow, we had a problem with it, and Roger here came to the rescue. Thanks a lot, Roger. No problem. I appreciate I'd it, man. I'd shake your hand, but I'm <laughs> dirty duty right now. I know what you mean. Thank you, no problem, Roger. No problem. Fun at this KOA is as limitless as the sand. There's a lot of local attractions to keep you busy as well. Book a North Carolina fishing charter trip, Visit the Cape Hatteras National Seashore and Lighthouse, the Graveyard of the Atlantic Museum, the Wright Brothers National Memorial, the Lost Colony Outdoor Drama, and much, much more. Well, there you have it. If you're looking for a great place for some summer camping, get the map out or put the coordinates in the GPS and head for some fun in the sun at the Cape Hatteras KOA. Join us again for another episode of Mark's RV Garage, and until then, happy camping.